My name is Kim Ponzio, and I am a past president of SWS and the current chair of the SWS Webinar Committee. And I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, go to the next slide, please. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. The general format for today's webinar will be a 45-minute presentation by our speaker, followed by approximately 15 minutes of uh, questions and answers. And at any time during the presentations, you can go to that questions pane and go ahead and type your questions, and I will pose the questions to the presenter at the end of his presentation today. The webinar is also being recorded, and you'll receive a link to that recording following the webinar. And we also ask that you take a minute to fill out that evaluation survey that will help us to plan for future events. And if you would like a copy of the today's slides, go ahead down to that handout pane, and you can find a PDF copy in the handout section there. And if you got practice on Twitter during the SWS Twitter Symposium in October and you're tech savvy, you can tweet about today's webinar at SW, hashtag SWS webinar. Next slide, please. We are proud to announce that this webinar has been pre-approved by the SWS Professional Certification Program and is applicable for continuing education credits that can be applied, applied to your Professional Wetland Scientist Certification or Renewal. Participation certificates are now available through an automated process. You'll receive an email from Michelle Chozek, our SWS Business Manager, about one day after the webinar. And you should check your spam email if you don't see that. Um, just click the appropriate link to get your certificate. Also, participation certificates are available for those who watch the webinar recordings that we have on our web page. And you can find that, uh, like you see the picture in the slide, on our past webinars page. So with the logistics out of the way, let's get started with our webinar. Next slide, please. Today our speaker is Dr. Hector Apunte. Dr. Apunte is a biologist with a master's degree in ecology from the University Paris Sud Orsay, France, and a PhD in biological sciences from National University of San Marcos, Peru, with a specialty in botany. He also obtained a master's degree in tropical botany and taxonomy and evolutionary systematics from the National University of San Marcos, Peru. Dr. Aponte has been a professor at the Universidad Scientifica del Sur since 2009. He currently holds the position of research coordinator of the Marine Biology Undergraduate Program. Hector has been studying coastal wetlands since 2006, conducting research on plant diversity, conservation, and ecosystem services. And nowadays, he directs research in alpha and beta diversity, as well as research work on the carbon cycle in wetlands. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn control over to Hector. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the people of the SWS that give me this opportunity to share some of, of knowledge I've gained in the last years about wetlands in Lima. I don't know if I have the control yet. Yes, I think I have it. Yes, so today we are going to talk about the wetlands of the coast of Lima. I've been working in the last 10 years on wetlands, but as I'm a citizen of, of Lima, and I, I don't know, I had this opportunity to, to live closer wetlands. I also work next to a wetland. Um, most of the information that I'm, that I'm going to share with you are from wetlands in Lima in the city, as you're going to as you're going to see in my presentation. And I am going to talk a little bit more about the patterns of diversity and challenge for conservation of, of these wetlands. Actually, we are going to maybe make a, a little discussion about if there are any pattern of diversity in this kind of wetlands. So first in the presentation, and I'm going to, I am going to share some slides just uh, for introduce you to the to the space, to the to these wetlands, what are their characteristics? And then I am going to talk especially about the results of some of the recent studies we studies we have been made in, in these kind of ecosystems. So 
This map shows um, a Lima, the Lima district of Peru. Peru. Lima is the capital of, of Peru. And uh, in the numbers and in the points, you are looking at some of the most important ecosystems in Lima. These are not all the ecosystems, the all natural ecosystems in Lima. These are just some of the most important. For example, in numbers, you have the Lomas Formation. Lomas formation are ecosystems that are maintained by the water evaporation from the Pacific Ocean. So this water evaporation goes through the Andes and this accumulates in some places and give the Lomas. Lomas is an stational ecosystem. So sometimes in winter, in winter there are Lomas and in summer there are not Lomas. These are, are very particular kind of ecosystems. Another kind of lomas is, for example, Tilancia lomas. Tilancia lomas are ecosystems uh, also uh, maintained by the evaporation of water, but uh, these are perennial because this kind of Tilancia are very particular from South America. So that is what you have in numbers. In the points with letters, you have the most important wetlands in the coast of Lima. These are not all wetlands, but it, this, this, these are just the most important. So for example, you have from south to north, uh, six, six of the most important wetlands in Lima. This one is, for example, the double M, the Medio Mundo wetland. So as you can see, some of these wetlands are lacustrine wetlands. And, all of these wetlands um, have their origin uh, in not, the, these are not much ancient uh, wetlands. This, these, are, these wetlands are very, very young. Most of them have less than 100 or 200 years, not, no more than that. So uh, most of the water that comes from this wetland comes from the Andes pass through the, the mountains and the underground, uh, past the, the underground table and then goes out near the coast. So for example, in this picture, you can see the Medio Mundo, Medio Mundo wetland, and next to the wetland, you, you can maybe see the, the, the ocean. So this lake goes uh, from groundwater table, very, very close to the, to the ocean. Uh, this is another picture another picture taken in this in this same wetland and as you can see in in this play in this picture you will find some birds in spanish these birds are named cormoran cormoranes these are cormorans so uh, uh, this picture is very special because we have the cormorans just placed next to the next to the 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 this panel says cormorant. It seems that they are uh, animals that learn very well their name in Spanish. But well, I think it's just casualty. But it it shows us also um, that these places are very very important for bird watching. And in the back of the picture, you can see some of the uses that we can do that we can some of the of the ways that people use the plants the plants fiber they dry it and they can construct some handcrafts for for sale um, this other picture is taken for another wetland actually this is a non-natural wetland it's an artificial one uh, it has also less than a hundred years and it was prepared constructing these rocks because um, there, uh, next, behind that rocks there, there is the, the waves that were very, very close to the, to the city. So they, they construct this, this, uh, this barrier uh, in a way to of controlling the, the waves. And when they did that, they form an, a very shallow lake that become a, a wetland. So it's a very beautiful artificial wetland. And also in Lima, as this one is in Callao. And as you can see, it receives lots of birds during migration. And it also have 
uh, cormorants as we saw in the last in the last photographs. So th these places are, as I said before, very important for bird watching, for do tourism, and uh, to uh, learn about the ecosystems of the animals. This one is Pantanos de Villa wetland. Pantanos de Villa wetland is another another uh, wetland here in Lima, and it's very important because uh, this is a Ramsar site. The, um, this is the only Ramsar site in, in, in the coast of Lima, actually. And uh, as you can see, it is surrounded by the urban ed edification. Now, as you can see in the back of the picture, you will see the urban area that have grown a lot in the last 30 or 40 years. So as we are going to see in other slides, for example, this is another one, you, you can find urban areas, agriculture uh, around wetlands. This, this wetland is the Humedal de Santa Rosa wetland that is very, very close uh, of Lima district. It's in the department of Lima and uh, and, is, and as we are going to learn about this wetland, even if it is surrounded by agriculture, by people, it has a very interesting structure in their communities, in the vegetal communities. This one is Pantanos de Villa. Uh, this is a view from Google Earth. So uh, we saw this part in the, in the previous photograph, but as you can see, there are people around everywhere. You will see, uh, uh, ways for the for the cars so it is a fragmented ecosystem and maybe this is another characteristic of this kind of wetlands they are wetlands very fragmented um, so their animal and vegetal communities might be adapted or might be resilient of this kind of characteristics this is another one this is Humedales de Ventanilla, wetlands of Ventanilla in 2010. Uh, so as you can see, there are people everywhere, fragmentation. Uh, and I don't know if you can see to the right side of the wetland. So when, when I change the, the, the slide, you will see this dramatic change in the same wetland. That is another characteristic of this kind of ecosystem. There is a rapid loss. Sometimes because these places have uh, a proprietor. I mean, um, most of these places are owned by people. So they are able to use it, to use it as they want. Even if there are politics that protect them, uh, these politics um, do not restrict to people that owns the land to do what they want. So sometimes we we found we find things like this. Sometimes, uh, sadly, this is the the reality in this one. No, in Humedales de Ventanilla, I am going back and going forward again, so you can see this big change in six years. So it goes uh, very well. Um, it, it agree very well with the observation that the wetlands around the world are, are being losing three times faster than forests. For example, this is one of the best examples here in Peru, in the coast of Lima. This is Humedales de Puerto Viejo. So we have the wetland around here and also houses, also uh, carways and, and other human activities around. So I think that with all this presentation, we are uh, very, very, um, we, we know very well this, this wetland. So we, which kind of information we have about these wetlands? What kind of information do we, do we have? We have mostly lists, list of mammals, birds, vegetation, protozo area, and other kinds of taxa. So what information can we use to make conservation decisions? So most of these decisions have been, been have been taken using this list. 
So uh, uh, there is something very good when we have a list because we know all the species in the, in the place, in the ecosystem, or at least most of the species from a taxa in the ecosystem. But the problem is that when we go further and further to in, into the information of this list, you will find um, some things that, uh, or some, some information that, that is lacking. For example, if we want to know uh, if a species is an endangered species, we are uh, the list is not enough. We are going to need, for example, population information. And that information, we don't have it all the time. We don't have that information all the time. So this is one big thing, one big problem. Another problem is that, for example, these places are surrounded by people. So if these places are surrounded by people, we are going to find species that comes from the urban area. Most of these species are considered alien species, and most of these species are considered um, weeds. So when you put a, a check, when, when you put an X next to the species that are considered weeds or that are considered uh, alien species, you will find that most of the wetlands have lots of weeds and alien species. So when we have to take uh, a decision and you find a place with lots of alien species, you don't want to conservate that place. At the first, uh, for, for when uh, at the, from the first side, when you when you look at that for the for the first time, maybe maybe you don't have maybe you don't want it. But what we have to understand is that. Um, this is the, the, the this is the way that the communities come from this place. So lists are not enough. We have to go farther, and also we can use the information from this list to understand what is going on with the with the diversity. Is there any pattern? Uh, we can use transect data to understand if there are some patterns in diversity in this in these ecosystems, and if these patterns tell us more about how these wetlands work and what decisions can we make uh, considering that information. So I am going to share with you some observation of this uh, that we have been made in these wetlands that comes from a perspective of, um, of diversity that it's very common right now. So we are going to analyze the diversity using a landscape perspective. In a landscape perspective, we have the landscape. In this picture, you will, the landscape is represented by the blue rectangle. So when we talk about the landscape perspective, we talk about the landscape composed but by, yellow tri by yellow rectangles. These yellow rectangles are considered habitats. So when we have an habitat, we are going to consider that at this level uh, we find we or we found the alpha diversity. When we study the changes between habitats, we are going to talk about beta diversity. The beta diversity is different than alpha diversity because alpha diversity diversity uh, studies the diversity of an habitat. Considering, considering its richness and its diversity and the diversity into the habitat. And it also considered that the habitat is almost uniform. So it considers a uniformity on the habitat. On beta diversity, we study the replacement of species between habitats. So we are able to study why it's going on uh, be, uh, between habitats. It, there, are there common species? Are there um, uh, different species? We can uh, also, uh, using a beta perspective, uh, have a, a vision of what is the diversity in the whole uh, landscape, because beta diversity uh, evaluates what is going on in the whole landscape. But also, gamma diversity uh, tries to study the information of the whole landscape. Now, when we talk about gamma diversity, we are going to talk about inform the information or or the or the diversity in the whole landscape. So, what I'm going to share with you are some of the informations of some of the observations we have made in these wetlands, considering considering these 
perspective of alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. The first observation we have made is that the alpha and gamma diversity is intimately linked to the anthropic processes. As I told you before, in the alpha and gamma diversity, we are going to find alien species. And it's because these wetlands is surrounded by people. But uh, the greater alpha and um, uh, gamma diversity in plants is, is percent, uh, we, we found this, this greater alpha and gamma diversity in the ecosystems of greater and lesser disturbance. Let me show you one of these results that is um, presented in this paper called Wetlands of the Central Coast of Peru, Structure and Menaces of Its Vegetal Communities. And what we find here, what we found here is that the communities of the greatest alpha diversity city is presented in the protected and in the endangered communities. Uh, we found it in places like Santa Rosa that is very endangered. In the most endangered uh, place, if we if we consider anthropic, for example, menaces like livestock, or for example, uh, agriculture, or I don't know, fermentation, have the biggest uh, alpha diversity, but also the protected ones. For example, in Medio Mundo, that uh, that is a very uh, it's a very well protected place. It, it, there are not as much urban areas as Santa Rosa we found also uh, a great alpha diversity. So it's very interesting. Uh, and for example, uh, this Ramsar site, um, the Pantanos de Villa have the highest historical uh, data uh, of plant diversity, but also Santa Rosa wetland. So we have the biggest, the, the most protected that have the biggest historical data of plant diversity, but also the less protected at the same time. This told us something about the, the influence of human around the place, because maybe we are, with our presence, in um, increasing the quantity of species. And maybe, maybe these species are, most of them are uh, weeds, weeds species that comes from the farming or agriculture but um, these species are not actually acting as, as weeds, acting as alien species. This uh, other slide showed us another, another wetland, a uh, very long but not wide uh, wetland in, in Lima that is called the Carquín Walmai wetland because this, district, this part of the district is called Carquín and this other part of the district is called Walmai, so we have this Karkin Walmai wetland. This is, this is a very small wetland, and when we started studying, we thought that there were not, that this was not an important wetland, but when we make a rigorous study during a year, we found that these wetlands have more than 40 species of vascular plants, and with this quantity of vascular plants, Karkin Walmai is a wetland that presents the highest number of vascular plant species per hectare on the entire coast of Lima. So it has the greatest uh, number of vascular plants per hectare, even more than the Ramsar site, even more than the protected areas. And this, this area is not protected. It's an unprotected wetland next to the coast, next to the, the urban area. You can see here people that comes from the wetland. They come to do laundry. They, they come here to to, to wash their clothes. And even that, there exist birds, but also there exist human impacts, as you can see in the back, in the back of, the, of the picture. And, but there are birds, natural birds that come here, um, natural uh, plants also that grows without any problem. Even if it has this conservation problem, this presents as the, as one of the most important wetlands in the coast. This, these birds in Spanish are called llanavicos. These birds uh, are trans-Andean migratory birds. So these are very important. Some years ago, most of ornithologists considered that these species are only in wetlands that are very well protected. Um, 
the recent research, it shows that um, sometimes it comes even if the wetland is not very well conserved, is not very well protected. Well, even these boats, the, these sites of the same county, um, we, we found this kind of bird. So this, this place, Karkin Walmai, uh, seems like a very, very important place to harbor not only plant species, but also bird species. Now, now we are doing some research to, to understand the bird diversity in this, in this place. And uh, also insects, well, we don't know much about insects and not another kind of taxa. This, uh, another study, it compares the wetlands of the coast of Lima. And as you will see, we found the Pantanos de Villa, P-A-N, that is the Ramsar site. And we found the Santa Rosa wetland that is a non-Ramsar site, non-conserved. And as you can see, the total of historical plants reported it in those places are the highest. So we have this kind of thing. So, um, and in the, and in here, you, you will find the, the number of invasive species reported and the introduced species reported in both sites. Almost the 50% of the species in both sites are alien introduced invasive species. So this characteristic is, uh, uh, this is a characteristic, is a characteristic of this kind of wetlands. So which are the consequences in, in management? It means that human activities are imminent uh, and we need an appropriate balance, not eliminate maybe human activities because maybe these human activities are increasing the possibility for plant species to, to be there, to live there. Uh, maybe we have to maintain, but properly. Uh, and. In, and this is and this is a very important thing when we want to do conservation because we can't tell people to go away. We have to maintain the the relationship relationships between people and, and the wetland between people and their kinds of life. So we have to respect also that. And we see with these results that uh, there could be very interesting. Uh, interaction between plant diversity and human activities. So when we analyze this Carquin Walmai wetland and also this Santa Rosa wetland, we can think about uh, a proposition that I've, I've learned from a Chilean, Chilean ecologist that the, some ecosystems behave as the, with the pro, with the Frodo, a, a, a Frodo theory, Frodo, this this guy of the Lord of the Rings, the smallest, the maybe the not a very very strong one, uh, seems to be the the hero in the Lord of the Rings. So here in Wetlands, we found the smallest, the not protected, that behave also like heroes in in these uh, places. In, in Lima. And other observations that we have been made in these ecosystems are related to beta diversity. The first one is that the regional beta diversity, it means the change of species, the change between species in these wetlands is greater in plants than in birds. Uh, while the regional richness of the species follows an inverse pattern. It means that at the regional, at the regional uh, scale, uh, we will find more, well, well, I'll show you, I'll show the picture. And also the, the other one is that the regional beta diversity is greater than the local uh, beta diversity. So as we are going to see here, here we are just comparing wetlands and as you can see uh, the similarity of these wetlands is very very low is less than 50 percent most of them are 40 percent of similar similarity it's a low similarity so it means that there is a high complementarity on plant species between these wetlands 
And this is very important when we want to take decisions of conservation, because if there are low similarity and high complementarity, which wetland do I preserve and which wetland we don't preserve, we don't conserve. So um, in this case, we have to preserve it all. I don't know, maybe. So especially considering that all these wetlands forms um, a corridor in the coast of Lima that allow birds, migratory birds to go from place to place during the migratory, the migratory season. When we analyze this beta uh, data, the data of beta, the changes between these, these wetlands, we, we see that in re regional, we have the plants and the regional scale in beta that is greater than birds. But when we see the richness, the richness goes, goes in from an inverse pattern. Also, CODI, CODI is an estimator of beta diversity. So we see also that regionally, the plants are have a high, highest beta diversity that the birds. So uh, that is also the um, the inverse between richness and between richness between plants and birds. So uh, this is very very interesting. But because as we as I told you at the beginning, when we when we just have list, we just just have part of the information. So we need to go farther to know what is going on in these ecosystems. And this is another another paper, uh, just to reinforce what I have what I've you have said, and uh, also here we have a correlation between richness alpha and beta diversity, and this is very important because when we use estimators of diversity, we want these estimators re reflects what uh, what is the change in the ecosystem, what is the change in the habitat and in their composition. So we need uh, indicators, we need indexes, indexes that uh, are correlated with richness. When we see which index, index, which of these index are related to richness, just the CODI index is related, related to richness. Um, so it means that one of the best index that we can use to follow these changes in the ecosystem is the CODI index that is a beta approximation of the landscape not the alpha approximation that is the most common that is the that everybody uses everybody uses shannon winner index for example so in this case uh, uh, shannon winner do not reflect what is going on with richness no we can see it here there is not correlation between Shannon Winner and the richness. So in this case, for these kinds of ecosystems, maybe beta index are better reflected what is going on. And also, um, to when, when we go to the field, to evaluate using beta indexes is easier than alpha indices, indexes because uh, we don't need to count abundances to get a beta indices but we need abundances when we use alpha an alpha approximation so there's less time in the field so it is very very important because sometimes time is money and also time is uh, getting the researcher fatigating in the in the field so in this case it's less time so it's, it's very interesting what we found here uh, in this correlation between alpha and beta approximations another thing that we have saw is that beta diversity is not correlated with distance which differs from other ecosystems evaluated in the world in the world normally uh, when we when we compare two places uh, the the greatest distance between these two places the greatest the beta diversity is uh, but this is not the case here so what you see is a cloud of points with no correlation with a uh, high with a very high p value so there are no, no this is not correlation between distance and for example beta diversity and uh, here i have jacquard that also evaluates simil uh, similarity between places and we found the same there are, there is no correlation so it means that these ecosystems as fo are following a very different pattern in these kind 
of approximation of beta diversity. So are, are there beta diversity patterns of, of the coast of Lima? We found usually that local beta diversity is smaller than uh, the regional beta diversity or diversity at regional scale. Uh, usually also uh, as the greater is the distance between points, the greater is the beta diversity. So this uh, leads consequence in conservation uh, if this pattern is followed. For example, uh, if this is followed, it does not make sense to conserve very close wetlands. The small wetlands could be ignored but because there are less beta diversity and the connectivity determines the current flora. For example, the closer wetlands are more connected. So it means that they, they share most of the species, but this is not the case here. Just it, the, the only one that is uh, followed is just the first one. The local beta diversity is lower than the diversity diversity in regional at regional scale but the other the other things doesn't follow the rule so what what can we do uh, uh, we, we have to continue understanding what is going on in in these places at the beginning of the presentation I'll, I talked to you about the low mass formation these stationary stational stational ecosystems that appears only during winter. And here we have Lomas de la Chai, that is one of the Lomas. And what we found here, it's an aquatic plant. So how, how did an aquatic plant uh, get into the Lomas formation? The only way is that a bird from a wetland uh, uh, translate this plant from the wetland to the Lomas formation. The closer Lomas formation is the Humedal Santa Rosa. And this uh, was the first register of an aquatic species, of an aquatic plant on a Lomas formation uh, in, uh, in the whole world. So this was the first report of this kind of things. It means that we don't have much information about connectivity between Lomas. We don't have much information between connectivity between wetlands but we don't have we have lesser information about connectivity between wetlands lomas urban areas and all the other information that we need to take better decision of conservation how many species are there in this coastal wetlands well if you sum very briefly you will find more than 300 of almost 400 species between mammals rotifers snails birds plants so there are a lot of of species there so do we know the total diversity of the vascular plants of the coastal wetlands of lima well if we use a non-parametric estimation here we have uh, the quantity that we know excuse me the quantity that we know and we have the this estimation so if we don't know these plants where are these plants where there are two possibilities the first one is that the species that we are missing are in localities uh, that are already known and the, the, uh, that the result of the these changes, for example, temporal beta diversity that we don't know much yet, or, or opportunistic plant invasive potential, for example, uh, are, are composing and changing all the time these species that we don't know. For example, some of these species appear only once in a place and then disappear and appears only once in other place. So this increases the estimation of the of the diversity in this in this wetland. So maybe the species that we are missing are plants or an opportunistic plants that appears and disappears, and uh, we are we are going to find it if we continue monitoring uh, these ecosystems. But also this told us that. These ecosystems, ecosystems have the potential to house plants of this type. Uh, as the time goes by, we are going to find more uh, urban areas, more wetlands closer to urban areas. So it is important to start uh, to start understanding this ecosystem as not a pristine ecosystem, but as urban wetlands. Yes, as, as urban wetlands. The second 
the second possibility of these plants is that the, is the, that the species of vascular plants that are missing uh, are found in other localities of this coastal region that have not yet been sampled. For example, uh, there are some lakes that are not sampled yet, so maybe there we will find. Maybe some of these places are treated as, at the beginning, we treat Carking uh, Walmai wetland that we thought that we thought it was not an important wetland, but uh, at the at the end of the of the work we found that was uh, that was one of the most important in the coast of Lima in terms of conservation. So maybe we we are losing wetlands that we don't know if they are important or not. As I said at the beginning, there are there are uh, very very lots of things to do to protect adequately the wetlands. First, we have to know them better than that. We have to understand what, uh, what is the, the dynamics of people, wetland, species at the same time. But also at the legal, from the political point of view, we have to reinforce politics. Here, for example, uh, we found a uh, an intent, an, an attempt for the the Pan Americanic Games to construct a big road uh, in on a wetland, uh, one of the wetlands I, I thought before. So they wanted to construct this over the wetland. Uh, all these. This was the the proposition, and the and there was not uh, there was no legal way to protect this wetland because this wetland was uh, a proprietor that wanted to sell the wetland. So this project uh, at, at at the moment right now this project has been abandoned because there was a big response from people, the look the science community because this wetland was, was, is one of the most important in Lima. So uh, it, is, it is very important to continue reinforcing the legal protection of these places. Other wetland near Lima that is disappearing is this one that is in Callao and it's going to disappear very, very soon. Uh, and this this wetland that uh, is in Callao, in Sarita Colonia, we doesn't know anything we doesn't know anything we don't we don't know anything about birds plants or, or anything and it's going to disappear very very soon uh, because of the airport the, the airport is need, need more needs more space and next to the airport we have these wetlands why do we know about them nothing nothing published yet so it is very important to understand why it's go what is going on there to proper uh, replace or uh, propose a correct, uh, I don't know, restoration or, or 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 do something adequately here. Because if we don't know, if we don't know nothing about these places and these places are going to disappear, maybe here are the species that that are lacking from the list. Maybe here we will find some things that are very very important. But if we lose it, we are just going to lose it. Um, as, as other wetlands are disappearing around the world. Well, that was what I what I wanted to share with you. Again, thank you very much for your time, uh, for your patience, for uh, attending this this webinar at the SWS. Here, there are my my emails. Maybe you would like to to the the papers that I, that I've shared with you in in this presentation so if you write to me I can I can send to you those papers so you will you will have it um, right away and this is also my Facebook fan page so follow me on Facebook thank you very much thank you Hector um, I want to go ahead and if you would advance the slide to the next one for me um, okay. I want to go ahead and get to the questions and answers. Um, I have a couple of questions here, and 
Uh, maybe we can just go in the order that I received them so that you can give us a little bit of more information. I, I think that a lot of questions just came up as you started to talk about the protection of these systems. And, and uh, so I think some of that might be uh, reflected in these questions. Uh, the first question is, with respect to wetland use, does your government require permits before the wetland is impacted, filled, or altered by humans? Okay, about the permits of use in wetlands. Uh, when we have a protected area, yes, we, uh, the state requires permission. But as I told you at the beginning, most of these wetlands are not protected. They have an owner. So this owner can do anything they, they, he wants or she wants with the wetlands. So we are facing this problem with uh, conscientization, I think it says. We have, we have to, to convince, uh, to, we have to, to, to tell these owners that what they are going to lose is very, very important and that they have alternative of use. Most of these people want to, to dry it all, to construct, I don't know, edifications. But we uh, have to convince, convince them that they have other opportunities, for example, uses, use them as touristic places, or use it as bird watching places, or use the fiber. But if we fail in, in this part, if we fail in combining them, we just lose the wetland. And this is what the NGOs are working a lot here in uh, tell people why wetlands are important, in tell people why they have to preserve it, and telling them that this, uh, this water that we found in coast is very, very important because next years we are going to lacking water. So if we don't protect these stocks of water, if we don't protect these places that uh, stock also carbon dioxide, uh, we are going to lose it all. So this is the, our only method to protect this wetland because as I told you at the beginning, they are, there is an owner and he can do what he want or she want with the wetland. Sometimes. The only protected yeah, well, wetland. I it, yeah. Yes, yes. I think that mm -hmm. brings up a couple of uh, really important points. Uh, the education of the, not just the people that own the wetland, but those that live around the wetland and maybe uh, the NGOs that are doing educating of these groups could mm -hmm. highlight some of the other ecosystem services that one, they already provide or that they will be losing if this wetland is destroyed with buildings or construction or, or urbanization of those areas. Um, it seems like uh, we have a lot of good stories to tell from other parts of the world where, where we've lost wetlands um, where we would hope that others wouldn't make the same mistakes that we've made yes, in some of the uh, other places where wetlands have been developed. Can you can you talk about um, you know we, you talked about that you have you know some of them are protected. Are they protected by the government? And also, does the government have the funding and the backing to buy some of these wetlands to conserve mm -hmm. them? Are there okay. programs for that? Mm -hmm. For example, I'll talk about two places. The one in the picture here is Pantanos de Villa Ramsar site. And, and for this place, the government have the, the, the money, let's say, the, the money to, to protect the part of, of the wetland that is in their hands. In this case, we have a, a, local, a local government, and at, let's say at Lima government, that uh protect very well this wetland the biggest part and also and also at national level that have um the funding to protect this place so in this case it's very very good so there's there is no problem with the with the proper pro, with property but for example in santa rosa wetlands uh, the the government is trying to recover the place um but from legal, from a legal point of view, so I don't, I am not very sure if they pay to recover the place or if they use legal, legal things to to recover the property of the place. But they, I think they are doing the second thing. So they are using legal things to recover the property of of the place. 
For example, in Puerto Viejo wetland, they are not doing anything. They are just working on education. I mean, when I say they, I mean government, NGOs, and all the people that is involved in these wetland problems, on in these wetland problematics. Well, and I, it kind of brings up another question for me about some of the human uses of this area. You talked about them using something for fibers, and, and from what I can see in the picture, uh, it looks like that cattail, but it may be not. Maybe it's some other kind of sedge or something there as well. Can you tell us what the dominant plant species are out there? Uh, yes, of course. Well, the dominant species here are almost three. We have the bulrush, the American bulrush, I think is the name, that is Scanoplectus americanus. Uh, this is one, uh, the, this is the one that is most used to do these handcrafts. And also okay. we have uh, other species of the same family, for example, of Cyperacea, we have Scanoplectus californicus. And also we have a Tifacia, a Tifa domingensis. So these three plant species are, are used, but from the three of them, the American bulrush is the most used to, to do handcraft, to do lots of stuff, very, very beautiful. So, and the, the problem with the, well, there is a very good potential to do handcrafts and to use those plants for um, this kind of human activities. But the problem is that uh, we have a lot of competition. We have to compete with Indian handcrafts that are uh, less price, uh, the, the price is less, is are cheaper than Peruvian ones when they come here. So we have to compete um, with them. And uh, also we have to compete with plastic. So sometimes people that use their time to do these handcrafts by, with the American ball rush, they are not able to sell their handcrafts at the way they want it. So sometimes they leave this activity. So it, it becomes a secondary increase of money for these people, a secondary income of money of, for these people. No, it's not a primary lifestyle. It's a secondary lifestyle. Right. So, mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, what did you say the third species was? You said American Bull Rush and Shonoplectus californicus. What was the third one? Yes, Tifa, Tifa dominicensis. T. Oh yeah, okay, uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Typha. Sorry, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I, it's all right. I say cattail. So, um, okay. so yeah. So anyway, thank you for answering that. I have one more um, question. Uh, someone asked online: Is this are these wetlands all saline wetlands, or are there some freshwater wetlands there as well? Mm, well, it depends in how close they are to the coast. Mm, some of them are very, very close, so the water of the ocean goes through the water table, so the, the water of the ocean goes through the water table that is in the continental plate. So it, it, uh, it uh, part of the wetland are uh, most, sal um, have a little bit of salt, but the other part, no, because the main quantity of water is fresh water. So the, most of them are fresh water, uh, but as, they are closer to the ocean. It sometimes shape. It depends on the weather. Not all the wetlands have the same characteristic. For example, Pantanos de, we, de Villa that we have here in the picture have three big lakes in the wetland. This wetland, this lake that we are looking at the picture is mostly fresh water. But there is another one that is very, very close to the to the beach. So it has most water from the oceans, ocean. So it depends even inside the wetland, which part of the wetland have more uh, salt, which part of the world of the water of the wetland have more salt, more salt. I do have, I have a question about the long, thin wetland that you thought was very small and maybe unimportant, and you found out that, I guess you called it Karkin wetland, the 3.4 uh -huh. species per hectare. Um, uh -huh. How big was that wetland? You said it was small, but I don't know how small small is. <laughs> okay, okay. And for example, Karkin, Karkin Walmai has two kilometers of long, two kilometers, but just 50 meters of wide, 50 or 30 in some some places. So it's, it's like a wow. tongue. Okay. It's a coastal tongue right. of wetland. <laughs> so uh, it's it's very small. When you when you are there, you say, oh, there's nothing here. But you start counting plants, and wow. 
there's right. very very it's a very interesting one the other thing i was wondering about too is um so there's all these anthropogenic um, impacts or threats to these wetlands what about uh, climate change in these coastal areas? Do we know what the effects of climate change on rising sea levels and uh, the temperatures and things like that will do to, you know, increase or decrease the resiliency of these ecosystems? Well, this is a very interesting question because we don't know much uh, about it. Uh, what we know is what is going. We know we have information about what's going on in the in the in the Andes place. So what is going on there? We have deglaciation. So deglaciation, what is going to, is going to be reflected in the coastal area with big um, with a big amount of water, or we think so. But after deglaciation and after this big quantity of water comes to the to the coastal area, we think that uh, we are going to have less less water. So we are going to have less water in the coast at the end of, of everything where we are talking about on a, on a time scale of a hundred years or less so um because for example we are considering that the biggest impact of the glaciation are going to be seen by 2050 so when i when i say that this is going to happen maybe this is going to happen from here to 30 or 40 years um so this is the only thing we know because we haven't followed we haven't we haven't followed the the patterns of i don't know for example precip uh, precipitation or how much water are there in these lakes we, we are not following that so it is very very important to start doing that to understand what is going on and also in species we we don't know if these species are changing uh, 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 if these species are, are changing on a time scale of 20, 30, or 40 years. As, as you maybe know, here in Peru, we also have El Nino and La Nina events that are, th these, these events, these weather events are very, very important because it definitely marked uh, the climb, the climb, the weather here. And, and the time scale are, are not 10 or 20 or 30 years. The time scale is two, three, or five years. So everybody is, um, involved in understanding how this is how this is going on wh how this is uh, changing the, the landscape but at the an, on a higher scale of 40 50 60 years we, we don't know very well our best hypothesis is the that that i have just held and maybe we are going to receive a lot of water and then we are going to receive nothing so maybe that, that is what it, what it's going to happen so how that are, is going to impact, for example, in agriculture, in la, la, livestock and, and other human activities, it will be a very, very important question to answer in, in short term, on a short term. Well, and I hope that, um, that when this becomes a, something that the members of the Society of Wetland Scientists are uh, aware of that, that you all can, you know, call on the expertise of all the members of SWS to help uh, with the protection and conservation of these ecosystems, but also um, in trying to find ways to be able to assess their current conditions, especially the ones that you haven't sampled yet. I know that I'm up for a road trip <laughs> to Peru. <laughs> but I, I, I hope that the SWS will be able to also help in, you know, some of the other ways that we've helped in other areas. We helped to protect a wetland in Macedonia that was under threat of being um, uh, construction, uh, sorry, constructed into a, um, a tourist attraction where they would have, they would have and all of the wetlands that were there. And, and, and uh, so things like that, I think can, SWS can be sort of a backdrop to help with information and, and uh, connections there. So I hope that that will happen. Um, I think we are out of time for questions. I want to thank you again so much for um, doing the presentation today, Hector. And um, thank if you. you would advance it to the next slide, I want to let our, our participants know about what's coming up. Um, if you go to the next one, we have our next webinar will be a free and open to the public webinar in December. And one of our wetland ambassadors, uh, Tatiana, and her 
um, mentor, Karen, who uh, Tatiana was a wetland ambassador and Karen is her mentor. They will be presenting the webinar in December and please invite all of your network of friends. Anyone can come and come to that. And then also we have some an exciting uh, development that's happening. We may be having our very first Spanish webinar in January. Um, and again, we will stay in South America to be a, uh, on the coastal wetlands of Colombia. And hopefully that will be happening in January 2019. So I hope everyone will uh, kind of keep your eyes out for all the SWS communications about that happening. Um, so again, I want to thank you, Hector, and, and, and thank you to the participants for participating today. Yeah, thank you very much. Goodbye.